Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Capaldo from NECAD Unity Ministries, North Providence, Rhode Island. Welcome. Thank you for listening. Um, I have um, another message today on the uh, 14th of uh, October. Um, I did one on friendship, and now I'm going to do one on fellowship, which is kind of a related thing, but uh, you know there are some 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 small differences. Um, but uh, fellowship comes in different forms. You know, you can have fellowship uh, among friends. You can have fellowship among disciples. You can have different different types of fellowship. But 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 normally, when we talk about fellowship in the uh, in the Christian faith, we, we mean that uh, spending time together as uh, as worshippers and followers of Jesus Christ. And it could be uh, uh, you know it could be in some kind of service, you know, some kind of church or in some type of study group, you know, Bible group or prayer group, um, or it just could be hanging out and you're just just kind of sharing experiences and, and just. Uh, sharing the love of God but there are different just as there are different forms of friendship you know there are different forms of fellowship fellowship is usually more in our spiritual lives and friendship uh, can can be either it can be a spiritual friendship or just a just a, a human friendship so uh, first uh, I'm going to first Chronicles chapter 6 and I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because uh, really we have uh, what God has given us here is the different um, uh, the different uh, generations of priests, the different lines of priests, and and really, I you kind of wonder when you see some of these lists, you know, in the First Chronicles or in the Book of Numbers, for example, when they go through these long lists of people, you know, in some kind of census, you kind of wonder, you know, what is what is all this doing in the in the Word of God? I mean, you've just got lists of names here in chapter six, you know, the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The descendants of Kohath included Amram, Mizar, Hebron, and Uziel, and it just goes on and on like that, and. Then, Later on, the sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The descendants of Gershon included Libni and Shimei. And on and on, the descendants of Kohath included Aminadab, Korah, Asir, Elkanah, etc., etc. Abiasaf, Asir, Tahath, Uriel, Uzziah, and Shal. So, anyway, these, these lines of priests, all of these different generations of priests. And uh, really, I think... Uh, what is the reason for this? I mean, who knows? Uh, who who can question God's ways? I mean, our ways are not His ways, and His thoughts are not His thoughts. Uh, why does He give these long lists of names? Is it that He's gonna He's gonna give us a test later, and we have to give back all these names? You know, we have to memorize all these names. <coughs> well, I think He's just trying to show. I mean, my own sense of all this is He's trying to show some kind of continuity. Is that? In, in families, there should be ongoing continuity from one generation to the next. And uh, very often there isn't. You find nowadays families get more and more fractured. But really, the idea is that a, a family continues and fellowship continues from one generation to the next. And this is really what God's desire is. That's what his plan is. It's kind of, you know, not the way the things have been turning out. Uh, when, when you see some of the things that go on in families and... and uh, you know how how people uh, that that you think uh, that that you think love you you know seek to hurt and destroy you um, you know it's it's a very sad thing it's a terrible thing and, and I'm sure we've uh, we've all had some experience with that re regrettably and I, I think the more that you uh, you really are following a relationship with Jesus Christ the more that you're open to this type of thing uh, happening but it really isn't the way that God intended it He intended one generation after the other of united family unified family. And un united, unified in, in Christ, in, in faith in the Lord God. So if you go to the book of Job, we can get another insight into, into fellowship. This might be kind of a, almost an uh, example of negative uh, fellowship. It's uh, Zophar responding to uh, Job. You know, Job has been, uh, has been complaining, you know, that God has been abandoning him. And uh, Zophar basically gives something that... Uh, it uh, comes across to me as kind of legalistic. He's kind of lecturing at Job and saying how the wicked will be punished, and uh, you know he's he's very uh, he, he's very judgmental and self righteous. It's not he, he, it's not like he's a prophet coming and saying you know I bring this word from the Lord God and that you know the Lord God says that you know his enemies will be killed. This is really someone who's lecturing a, a friend. This is a so called friend lecturing someone in kind of a very self righteous way. So it's uh, if it's if it's an example of fellowship, it's kind of you know negative. Negative, negative fellowship is, uh, and you can contrast that with uh, some, a couple of the examples we'll have later of you know uh, apostles and disciples getting together and having true fellowship in the in the Word. So this is this is Zophar's lecture to uh, to Job. This is uh, chapter uh, 
20 of Job. Zophar said, I must reply because I'm greatly disturbed. I've had to endure your insults, but now my spirit prompts me to reply. Zophar says to Job, don't you realize that from the beginning of time, ever since people were first placed on the earth, the triumph of the wicked has been short-lived and the joy of the godless has been only temporary. So he's, he's telling Job, you know, that he's really, he's, he's behaving badly and he better shape up, you know. Don't, don't you just like it when, you know, friends just let, lecture at you and nag you all the time about, you know, how bad you are and, you know, you should have done this and you should have done that. And, and, and especially when it's family members, you know, being critical and judgmental, that's, that's the best of all, right? Though the pride of the godless reaches to the heavens, and their heads touch the clouds, yet they will vanish forever, throw, thrown away like their own dung. Those who knew them will ask, where are they? So he's being, he's being very harsh here, and, I mean, and, and Job did have a loss of faith, but he also was a man of great faith, and a man who recovered his faith. And it is true that he did suffer, uh, you know, he went through those periods that we go through, and instead of being a little bit gracious, Zophar is just kind of nagging at him, you know, and, and just telling him that he's, uh, you know, he better shape up or he's going to be like one of these wicked people that will be, uh, you know, doomed to, uh, to destruction. They will vanish forever, thrown away like their own dung. Those who knew them will ask, where are they? They will fade like a dream and not be found. They will vanish like a vision in the night. Those who once saw them will see them no more. Their families will never see them again. Their children will beg from the poor, for they must give back their stolen riches. Though they are young, their bones will lie in the dust. They enjoyed the sweet taste of wickedness, letting it melt under their tongue. So he's, he's, uh, he's being very harsh, and there, there's a time for that. But is this really, is this really uh, coming from a prophet uh, this is not a prophet, this is really a, a so-called friend who has just taken it upon himself to lecture, to, to lecture Job. But it's not, uh, the, the, there, there's, no, uh, there's no sense of prophecy here. Uh, Zophar, the name of that, replied, I must reply, you know. So that's him, that's coming from him. They savored it, holding it long in their mouths, but suddenly the food in their bellies turned sour, a poisonous venom in their stomach. See, these are, you know, when you behave wickedly, you, you have all these plagues that descend upon you, and this is it's really, it's just kind of threatening. I mean, do you like it when people talk like that to you? Is that, you know, you, uh, you, know you, you, you better do this, you better do that, you know, you haven't done this, you haven't done that. Um, you know, it's, it's, not a very, it's not a great way to have fellowship or friendship with people. They will vomit the wealth they swallowed. God won't let them keep it down. They will suck the poison of cobras. The viper will kill them. They will never again enjoy streams of olive oil or rivers of milk and honey. They will give back everything they worked for. And, and so this is, there's really, there's just kind of a hopelessness in, uh, in, in, his, uh, in his speech is that, you know, like there, there's no hope. You know, people go beyond a certain point and then God could not possibly forgive them. And there are people that reject God. I mean, there's no question about it. I mean, we're, we're, uh, we're called to relationship with God, and there are people who reject him. But Zophar is just, uh, he's, he's kind of, uh, he's creating this, uh, this uh, picture of hopelessness that, you know, why if you've been wicked for a long time, it's like you'll have, you'll have uh, there's no hope. He's being very judgmental about, you know, what, what God can do. You know, God, God can heal if, you're, if you are, you know, wishing to receive emotional or spiritual healing. You know, God can heal. Their wealth will bring them no joy. For they oppressed the poor and left them destitute. They foreclosed on their homes. They were always greedy and never satisfied. Nothing remains of all the things they dreamed about. Nothing is left after they finish gorging themselves. Therefore, their prosperity will not endure. So this is, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, he, he, he has a very pessimistic view of other people. And, and not one of us is good. No, not one. You know, there, certainly there is that... Uh, that, that problem of, you know, man's independence from God and, and that independence really is the, uh, the definition of sin, is that desire to be independent from God, which uh, started in, uh, in the garden, started with Adam and Eve. Uh, but at, at the same time, this, this is a very, um, uh, the, this picture that he's painting is, is no hope. And certainly there, there is hope if you're willing to trust Jesus Christ, there is hope. Um, and it's true when you fall short of the mark, 
you know, when you concentrate on the things that aren't the things of God, it is true that, you know, uh, you know, God's not going to bless that. And, you know, God can take away things, you know, and God, uh, just as he can give things, he can take away things. But, but instead of focusing on what's wrong with everyone, which is what Zophar seems to want to do, and, and by implication he's suggesting this is what's wrong with Job, you know, we, we should be looking more at uh, true fellowship with God and not, not looking at this very uh, negative example. In the midst of plenty, they will run into trouble and be overcome by misery. May God give them a belly full of trouble. Now, there, now, see there, this is revenge. This is man trying to take revenge. May God rain down his anger upon them when they try to escape an iron weapon. A bronze-tipped arrow will pierce them. The arrow is pulled from their back, and the arrowhead glistens with blood. So the terrors of death are upon them. So there's really, there's no grace here, you know. I mean, uh, uh, it's kind of this, this business in... in uh, in uh, Nineveh, that you know, jo Jonah thought that uh, you know that uh, he, you know, why is he being punished? I mean, there are other people that should be punished more than than uh, uh, you know more than he should be punished, and he was being punished as well. But I mean, the the thing is, you you don't if you wish misery on other people. I mean, very often you're going to bring it to yourself. I mean, God doesn't want you to wish bad things for other people. He, he wants you to pray for other people, and he wants you to, to, to help them if they need help. He doesn't want you to be exploited or taken advantage of, but, but you know, may, may God give them a belly full of trouble. You know, that's not, much, that's not a really good prayer. I mean, that's, that's a bad prayer. I mean, if you're wishing bad things for other people, uh, no, I think I think in, if you believe that you're being persecuted by people, the thing to do is is to pray that God will help them awaken, that that you know that God will help them wake up and understand that they're just uh, you know they're 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 going the wrong way, you know that 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 they need they need the love of God and they need faith in Jesus Christ. You don't wish you don't wish them misery. You don't wish them a belly full of trouble. You don't wish for God to rain down anger upon them. That might be the consequence of persistent disobedience. But to wish that in a, in a prayer, as Zophar is here, is very, is very unloving. Yeah, it's very unloving. It's, it's the, the, the opposite of the whole idea of fellowship. Their treasures will be thrown into deepest darkness. A wildfire will devour their goods, consuming all they have left. The heavens will reveal their guilt, and the earth will testify against them. A flood will sweep away their house. God's anger will descend on them in torrents. This is the reward that God gives the wicked. It is the inheritance decreed by God. And God will destroy what God will destroy. But, you know, it's not up to man to judge. You let God judge. And uh, so far as being... Uh, he, he's being, you know, in, in incredibly insensitive and judgmental of his friend, and uh, you know, it just, it, it just, uh, when I read it, I find it very unsettling that, uh, that that he that he talks to his friend this way, and that he considers himself a great friend. It seems to be almost like he's uh, he's giving up, uh, he's giving up on Job, that he doesn't want Job's friendship. But sometimes we have people like that, that, you know, that, uh, that they're in our lives, you know, that they, they, they pretend to be close to us and they're not really close to us, you know, they really, they want something else besides true friendship, and true fellowship and true love. So a couple of more passages, the book of Acts, chapter 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied... As the word was given to the Gentiles, and uh, along with the Jewish people, so now there are more and more believers. As the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. You can't imagine that, can you? A group of believers with discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, there you go, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve, the twelve apostles, called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God. So that's the ultimate type of fellowship. Teach the word of God, not running a food program. So there you go. Now you go and you now feed someone. And God's not saying don't feed someone. But really the purpose in, in, in life is to feed ourselves the word and then let God bring in you know, the, the, the food for our bellies. But really, really we're not, we're, the, the, the purpose is not, just you know works you know works can be of the flesh and it's good it's good to give food if you believe you're called to that and you know we're you know work in a soup kitchen i mean that's the, the, that that's great but the priority is always the word of god it's the word of god and it's the it's the holy spirit that should direct you to the different activities that you fulfill um not simply you go around you know about it you don't 
just kind of you know run around trying to do things to 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 win God's favor. No, you wait on God. You know, you pray and you ask for revelation. You know, what what activities do you have for me? What do you what do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve? And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility to teach the word. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. So find the people who are supposed to be going out and giving food, you know, who's, who, who are full of the spirit and wisdom and they're well respected and this is their calling. We'll send those people to run the food program. We'll send the, the people who, who are called to give food, we'll send them out to give food. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. That's what we're supposed to do. Everyone liked this idea, so unity, and they chose the, the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith, to, to believer, belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, these seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So unity, fellowship, one God, so God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted to the traditional Jewish priests. And one final passage in James, chapter 2. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? So there's no there's no favoritism for God, right? You know, God God loves us all. He gives us the um, equal opportunity to believe and to serve. For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? In other words, you're worshipping mammon, right? You're worshipping money. You have a lust for money. And, uh, you know, this, this, this is very sad. God does not begrudge us money. Uh, he knows that we need, a, we, we need income, we need employment, we need money to live, and, he, and we, are, we are supposed to work and do our work as unto the Lord. What God doesn't want is an addiction to money. And you see this very often, that people are so moved to chase money you know, and this, and you see it, and you see it in the church. I mean, if if you're catering to the people who appear to have more money, and you're neglecting the people who don't have money, uh, isn't that discrimination? Does God want you to discriminate? God loves everyone, and especially believers. And the word is the word. And if people have come to worship, whether they're well dressed or not well dressed, don't you greet them the same? Don't you treat them the same? I mean, why do you cater to the people with money? And you should love everybody the same. And if God has blessed some with clothes and the rest of it, okay, that's where they are in their journey. And if uh, God uh, has not yet blessed other people, well, those people can, uh, can, through faith, they can trust God and they can eventually have their needs met or, you know, more of their needs met. And, and, but really, it's not up to us to discriminate. It's not up to us to say we're going to love the people more who have more money and the people less who have less money. That's, that's uh, being guided by evil motives. There it is in the scripture. That, that, is, that is really evil. And yet, in the church and outside the church, you see very often this case of you know, people chasing money. And uh, it happens in churches, and it happens in families. I mean, you know, we've had in our, both of our families, you know, we, we've been, we've been uh, savage you know, in certain cases by people who just love money. You know, and money becomes their god. And it's, it's, it's very sad, it's very troubling. But this is what God is trying to tell us, is that you don't make money, you don't turn money into a God. You know, God will meet your needs, but he doesn't want you to develop this addiction or this lust for money, and you're trying, you know, you're, 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 you're screwing people that you're supposed to love and support and, uh, and help because you love money. It's something we see all too often in the church, and 
also all too often in families and we see it on the job and we see it in different places you know in the, on the job you know people kind of walking all over each other to get a promotion and it really is is sad it's it's one of the biggest th things you know that's why god says you know uh, that the love of money is evil not the money itself but the love of money is evil because it's it's one of the things that that, that people develop this this addiction to and, and they just they, they just can't get away from it and it, it's it destroys them and it destroys other people it does all kinds of damage and uh god's saying right here it's 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 evil if you discriminate on the basis of how much money people have that's evil listen to me dear brothers and sisters hasn't god chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him and they inherit the kingdom. And Jesus came, he didn't, Jesus didn't come to establish a religion called Christianity. He came to talk about the kingdom of God. That's what he came to do. He's the son of God. He's the, the perfect uh, human manifestation of, uh, 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 of God. Um, and, and he came to talk about the kingdom of God and how to have, uh, how to have faith in God. Call on the name of the son and, uh, and then uh, you know, be reborn of the spirit and then obey the spirit. Uh, and that's the kingdom of God. Once you're born again and saved, I mean, you are, you know, you, you've been translated into the kingdom. Now you can grow in the kingdom or not grow in the kingdom. You can bear divine fruit or not to bear, bear divine fruit. That's up to, the, to you. That's up to the decisions you make. But uh, really, that's uh, the ones who will inherit the kingdom are, are the, the, the poor in this world, meaning the poor. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're materially poor it means they could be poor of spirit or or that they have simply humbled themselves they put themselves in a suit in an inferior position you know they, they've put themselves on their knees so to speak uh you know before god and 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 and, and before others they consider other people higher than themselves they're they're that they've put themselves in that position but you dishonor the poor isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? And, and very often it is. It is. Mon money is, is such a, a corrupting influence, as I was just saying a couple of minutes ago. It's, it's they're, they're, you know, when, when there's some kind of big problem in life, you know, some big fight, uh, you know, usually you, you, when you look behind the scenes, somehow, you know, money is, uh, is usually involved, you know. I mean, when things are really going wrong and there's some big disagreements and arguments and things like that, very, very often people are fighting over money. One way or the other, it could be directly about money or indirectly about money, but somehow it's involved. Yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal laws found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking, breaking the law, the, the, word, the word of God, not the, not the 613 rules of the Mosaic law, but, but God, God's uh, commandments. You know, God gave us moral principles in the Old Testament, the, the, the Ten Commandments, which, which have been carried over into the New Testament. The, the, the Sabbath is, is handled differently now. We rest in Christ uh, every day. That's what we're supposed to do. That's our Sabbath. But basically, the, mo the, the moral rules and principles, uh, as exemplified in the Ten Commandments, have been carried over. And we have the grace teachings, you know, the, the love and the compassion and the mercy and the giving and the service and, and, and that kind of thing. So if you love people with money more than people without, you are breaking the, the teachings, the commandments. For the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. So really what we're trying to do is to, to, is to obey, obey. Um, and you know when you when you don't follow the law of love it's as though you broke all the laws you know if you don't follow the law of faith or you know the service if you, it, it, you there's going to be an interruption in your spiritual growth if you break even one of the one, one of the instructions one of the commandments that god has given and and even for the period of grace right we're supposed to, you know, uh, these grace teachings, and we're supposed to follow all of them. If you, if you, uh, if you don't follow some of them, there is going to be an interruption or a reduction of your growth. Yeah? For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. And, and here we know adultery can be the physical adultery or it can be spiritual adultery. And murder can be actually uh, killing someone. Uh, or it can be murdering with your thoughts. You know, there are a lot of people who murder with their thoughts. They're, they're quite good at it. So if you murder someone but do not commit adultery, you've still broken the law. You've broken God's commandments, right? You know, you've, you've done one thing, okay, but then you broke the other one. So still you're in that area where you have not been fully obedient. 
And so whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. So in other words, this is it's true, true fellowship when you can respect all of God's uh, uh, teachings and instructions and um, you know what he what he sets before you to do. That's your full fellowship, and as many as many of those instructions as you follow, that's the, that's your degree of fellowship. That's how much fellowship you have with God. There will be no mercy for those who've not shown mercy to others. But if you've been merciful, God will be merciful when He judges you. And that's that's one of the grace teachings. So as much as you follow the teachings, that's how much you are in fellowship with God. So that's it for the second message. Thank you again, Father, for this time together, and thank you for being with us and watching over us, and we ask that this uh, message will be a blessing to those who've heard it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Betsy. You're welcome.